closely where I lived. It was different now. It was all old built. The streets was rough compared they are today. I used to go to Oak Street School, that's just, just down the road, and I had a very good childhood. But the war did finish it and upset everybody and then bombing started and it was all changed and then everybody changed. The world started to change all around. The main centre of the town is a lot different than what it is today. That they used to have markets in the street and that, but now it's all closed in. All the boring you could not get up and down the street for traffic. And that is a good thing today, that you can walk around the town and you haven't got to be feared of traffic. But before then, you just couldn't move in the town. There was buzzes here and buzzes there, and it's a wonder there was more accidents than there was. But today, it is quite nice to go around the town. With under the subways, it's really nice to walk around the town. Letting the new year in. Well, now, that goes straight back to the days of the witches. It's centuries old. And it was always the custom that a dark man let the new ear in. If a woman let it in, it was the worstest of bad luck. And so at about two o'clock in the morning, you know, all the men used to get together and get into groups and then go and sing outside the door. And they sung a song that goes back to Saxon days. It went somehow like this. Here we come a wazzling amongst the leaves so green. Here we come a wazzling so far hard to be seen. God send you happy, God send you happy, may God send you happy and a joyful new year. After that lot, the missus used to open the door and the dark-headed and used to nip in, you know, out through the back up the entry, then in again with his mates, and they all had a drop of summit. Then they'd move on to the next door and carry on the same. Of course, about five o'clock in the morning, they didn't know where they was or who they was. So they used to knock at the first door they come to. And they'd shout up to the missus when they shoved the head through the bedroom window. Come downstairs, will you, missus, and pick your one out of we? <laughs> now, you remember old Charlie on the chase? Well, he was telling me about old Juddy. And one New Year's morning, Juddy's missus shoved her head through the window and I looked down at him. And I says, mine I amongst you, lot. So, of course, they all moved on. Juddy with them. And when the women had picked their own out, there was only old Juddy left. So he sat on a doorstep. When old Charlie was going to work at about half past six in the morning, he seen Juddy, so he says, what's up with you, Juddy? And Juddy says, of course you are house anyway, Charlie. Charlie says, of course you go. Yeah, I'm sitting on your doorstep with your back to it. Then here, old Juddy, I should come and fetch your Juddy in, Mrs. He's lost. He says, oh, he's all right. He'll find himself as soon as it's too late to go to work. I've never was coming back. Then he'll swear blind half the time it won't him as went. When I was a boy, we used to go for picnics onto West Wickham Hill. And uh, we had to walk, of course, about five miles across the common and through the woods. And when we got there, there was always a, a toboggan to ride. We used to ride down the hill on this toboggan and start at the top and slide it down. And when, if you got a good run, you could go right down to the bottom of the hill or... Uh, even farther into the road, but there was no danger there because there was no, nothing on the road. And then, of course, you've got the job of pulling it all the way back up the hill. That wasn't so good, but still, it was good fun. We used to uh, get uh, to bargain for an hour for tuppence or a penny, I forget which it was. Very little, and it was jolly good fun, really. I'm a Methodist local preacher, and I've been spending a Sunday down on a corny's farm. It was dark, but the sky was started when the farmer's daughter and I set out to go to the village chapel where I was to conduct the evening service. She suggested taking a shortcut by going through a path field. 
And so we climbed over a stile into the big field and started going through it when suddenly a mist came on and we became lost. We went round and round that field and just couldn't find the stile over which to go to get into the road leading to the chapel. My guide, who was a middle-aged woman, had been through that field hundreds of times and knew it like the back of her hand, but she was as helpless as I was. Then at last she tumbled to it. I know what it is, she said. We're being pixie-led. She told me of other people who'd been pixie-led in that same field and of horses left in the field overnight, being found next morning covered with sweat, having been chased hither and thither by the pixies. Well, I said, what have we got to do about it? There's only one thing to do, she said. We must turn our pockets inside out. I turned all my pockets inside out, and she did the same, or said she did. And sure enough, believe it or not, we found the style in no time. We were late in getting to the chapel. The congregation had given us up for lost, and were about to go home. I shall never forget that night in that field when I was pixie-led. O oh Lord, you knows as there be all sorts of languages and modes of speech. So I reckon you won't take it amiss if I talks to you as an old Cotswold man likes to talk. Now, Lord, I'd like you to keep an eye on that allotment of mine. Don't they let too much rain fall on it, especially at the bottom end. If it gets too wet down there, I can't do nothing with it. Time was when I could turn it up in lumps like osses, yuds, and let the weather get to work on it. But you know, Lord, as I ain't got the strength in me now. But thanks to you, I don't do so bad for an eighty-year-old. Then there's that old apple tree in our cottage garden, planted as a pip by my father when he first got married. It bears a wonderful crop most years. And although it yon't any recognised sort, it has been a blessing to we. I do love my apple turnovers, all sweet and moist. Just right for an old un with very nearly no teeth left. And I all say as my old woman knows how to make apple turnovers. Ah, pies, puddings and tarts as well. You know, Lord, that there tree be a living sermon. Just think what you did, all from a blackish-brown pip eighty-one years ago. What a show of blossom we has, to say nothing of the fruit. And it'd be nice to sit in the shade of him when we got him in it, which you not very often. Then it's a perch for the birds, very handy for the clothesline on a washing day, and we has our wireless aerial tied to him. Yes, Lord, you done a wonderful job with that third tree. Well, I can tell you about an old pudding which has really gone out of fashion. It's more suitable, really, for the men folk who come in when they're really tired and been out probably on a wet day, and they call it lampler pudding. Uh, now, this is made from uh, buns and biscuits, and these are steeped in hot ale. And uh, after they'd done the steeping, they used to add spirit and uh, seasoning or sugar to the man's liking. And most of them liked a fair amount of spirit with their lampler pudding. Year pudding's a grand thing round here, and that's made in the springtime. Uh, we had Romans here, and of course the Romans are blamed for bringing nettles to England, never mind Cumberland. And as we had a Roman camp quite near to Cockermouth, we've got a good lot of nettles. Now, herb puddings are made from greens out of the garden and nettles, um, blackcurrant leaves, everything's all boiled up together and uh, with it is barley. It's all mashed and then you take it and your blood's pure for the rest of the year. You also use the juice, if you like, to uh, wash your hair, just to keep your hair in good condition. You'll probably have noticed along by most of the old uh, country cottage gardens that they have a, an edging of boxwood. Now at one time this boxwood was grown for a great deal of purposes, one of which was to uh, stop a man from going bold. Uh, his old woman had to collect boxwood, boil it 
and uh, rub his head with the juice after he'd got to bed of course because um, he had to lay quiet when he'd got the juice on his head and so the best place for it was bed and if that didn't cure him from going bald well he got to rub with a raw onion and then if your eyes bothered you well you gathered a few celandines and made an eye wash from celandines uh, and an old lady said to me celandines aren't only good for your eyes she said they're gay good for your corns During the last war, I used to travel up and down from Tynmouth to Plymouth by train in the mornings and evenings. And uh, at that time, they had first introduced a tannoy system at Newton Abbott Railway Station to make the announcements of the train times. And on this particular morning, we arrived at Newton Abbott and we heard the announcer say, Newton Abbott, Newton Abbott, train now standing at number four platform going to Plymouth. Over the bridge to Torquay, hurry up and take your zates, the train's about going. Just recently, I had to travel down to catch the Torpoint ferry, and I left here in a rush to get there because I knew the time of the ferry to leave was about due. And I went rushing down, and the man on the gate was just closing it when I arrived, so he opened it again and waved me through. And I went down to the ferry, and as I drove on board, I said to the ferryman, how about that for good timing? And the ferryman said, You'm lucky, we'm late. I've been working in the pits about eight years when I shifted to a little pit village called Fatfield. Uh, I was working at Harrington Colliery at the time. I've been living in Gateshead for six years, then I moved to the village, a little pit village, and it was the morning of the big meeting and saying the barn form up. Uh, outside the miners' welfare in Fatfield. Then I used to get on the train and follow the band into Durham and watch the big parade down Silver Street. And this is where all the bands from the different lodges, miners' lodges in the county, used to parade down Silver Street, down onto the race course to listen to the traditional um, Durham Miners' Gala speeches. Now there was all sorts of bands, local bands, Scots bands, and say the lads, the young miners and their wives, dancing up and down in front because it was a big beer day, uh, the gala, as well as the, uh, as well as having this political significance, it was a, a big jollification day as well. In my time, anyway, you know, it had developed from uh, the stone political ground that it started off with. And then I used to go down onto the race course, the Hopmans were there, the fairs, the pubs were open all day, go down onto the race course and whichever speaker you happen to fancy listening to, you're going to make your way and listen to him, listen to all the promises and rubbish that they used to spout out. <laughs> a lot of it never ever happened. And then, oh, about five o'clock at night, you'd see all the bands pack up and make their way back home. And um, the rest of the evening was just given over then to just jollification, just a normal gala day, shows and dancing. And that's about what it meant to me. One morning near the market I was slowly passing by. Twas there I saw a seedy man with reed and bleary eye. He looked at me, I looked at him. He said his name was Bill, and asked us if I didn't know him, and what I stand a Jill. Says I, yeah, the best of me. If I've seen ye before, I cannot recollect the time. Says he, we're near the door that leads to Christian comfort. So Henny stand a Jill. Oh, then is just three happens, and I'll pray for you. I will. Three happens that I haven't got, says I, with me the day. Or else I'd let your head, says I, and try to move away. He clutched us tightly by the arm, says he. Come stop, I beg, for I've only got a happeny. Will you stand at the meg? I chanced to have a happeny, whiz. I handed it to him, says he. God bless your bunny fiesse, you like me Uncle Jim. I moved away, but late at night I passed the very door, and there, as drunk as man could be, was the one I'd seen afore. He didn't seem to nars again, for hadn't out his hand, says he, Come here, my canny man, what are you going to stand? I've only got a half Jill's price, he shouters out again, but the everlasting happenings charms were me was fairly gain. Says I, me man, I pity you. But pity does no good. You've showed your paltry swindle tis. Try walk, I sure you should. I like the man that checks his Jill, 
and decency had, dear. But, oh, the man deserves contempt that cadges for his beer. I heard cuckoos, Marnin. I heard him. I heard him go cuckoo, cuckoo. I were just thinking about getting out of bed when I heard him. So I says to Mrs. Mrs. Can you hear cuckoo? Her never answered I. Her were asleep. So I gives her a bit of a shake, careful like, and I says, Mrs. Can you hear cuckoo? She did open her eyes then and looked at I a bit anxiety like. What to say? I says, can you your cuckoo? Your cuckoo? No, I can't hear now, cuckoo. Well, thee bide quiet and listen. So we bide quiet, and then we hears and again. Cuckoo, cuckoo. Don't sound like cuckoo to me, Mrs. Says. Well, I don't know no other bird as does say cuckoo, does thee? She says, oh, I don't know. I be going back to sleep. Where can I up the year, cuckoo? Do you get off up the milk and ask these be late? So I pulls on me trousers and I puts on me boots. And I was just going on down past the boy's door when he hollers out, Feather, did your cuckoo? I says, ah. Well, you come on, on in your and you can see him. He be sitting in timber top up by Miss Ailey's cottage. I says, well, I knew he wasn't fur away. So I goes in with boy, and we looks through winder, and there he were, sitting up on timber top, up by Miss Ailey's cottage. I looks at him, and I looks at him, and I says, that ain't nar cuckoo boy, that be pigeon. Now I'd like to tell this story about a friend of mine who's retired, one of the old veterans, he doesn't knock about much, but the high spot of his year is the cup final. He never misses going to Wembley, and he goes down for the weekend. He makes a weekend of it. Everything booked up, everything of the best. Two years ago he went, so on Saturday morning he had a nice stroll round. He strolled up Regent Street, along Oxford Street, as far as the Marble Arch, and a nice stroll up the Edgware Road, and going up the Edgware Road, he passed a pet shop and there was a parrot in a cage in this pet shop and just as he was passing this parrot said I know they he thought that's marvellous a parrot in London talking lanky dialect so he went in the shop he said I'll give you out the want for that bird name the price but the proprietor said no Polly's not for sale I'm sorry he says but you're very lucky because Polly's laid some eggs this week and if you like I'll sell you an egg I can put it up in a box Surround it with cotton wool, it will keep it warm, and you can incubate the egg quite successfully when you get home. Now, last year he went again as usual, same old programme, down on the Friday, Saturday morning, walked up Regent Street, along Oxford Street as far as the Marble Arch, and then strolled up the Edgware Road, and he was just passing the same pet shop. There was the same parrot in the same cage, and just as he was passing, the parrot said, I know thee. So he turned round, he says, Ah, and I know thee too. The father were a duck. I was in Welton Jail in 1930, and I got seven days. Do you know what it was for? Not paying a fine, because I was out of work and, and had five kids, four kids, and couldn't afford to keep the kids at the time, never mind pay a, a fine to go to jail. Seven and six in them days was like seven pound, wasn't it? Anyway, the, the detective come to ask me was he going to pay the fine. I says, yes, it's had it a week. He said, what the blazes you think we are, club collectors? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the next morning I went to Walton to work the fine up. I was in two days. And your mother came down, paid the fine, got me out. But uh, that was only because the new road traffic act came into force. And that was hanging on the back of a lorry with a bicycle getting a toe up a hill on a bike. And the bobby pulled the, the wagon up. You remember the old steamers with the trailers on the back? One of them it was, about four mile an hour, <laughs> going up a hill. And the bobby had the cheek to say I was uh, pinching a ride.
They used to say that the best road out of Manchester was a bottle of gin or whatever poison you happen to prefer. Maybe it's the gin that's gone off, because the best road out nowadays is the East Lanx, the one that runs the 30-odd miles from Manchester to Liverpool. And that's the only city that seems to have the character of everybody's hometown, and particularly the hometown of a Manchester man. The East Lanx is easily grained into any Manchester man's makeup. Whenever the planners have tried to make the city and Salford, the neighbour, the bastard place that looks a mess on a map but is a real separate thing when you get to know it, they've had to take into account that East Lanx road. It's there and there's so much traffic on it you can't rub it out. And you wouldn't want to when you reckon that it links up the two warmest places in the North West. I've never been able to make up my mind about what it is that's common to Manchester and Liverpool. Maybe it is the commonness, the everydayness of life in both of the pair. Or again, maybe it's what relieves that everydayness, the sense of a past and a present that promises everything, only to be dashed day in, day out by the fret-working businessmen who seem to have got the upper hand in both cities. But even those businessmen, you see, haven't quite quelled the life in the rabbit warren that's mid-Manchester or the weasel run parallel to the Mersey that's known locally as the Liverpool Dock Road. So what I'm really saying, if it needs saying, is that the East Lanks Road has to be there for the sake of us all. That's Mancunians and Liverpudlians. Liverpool, if you're from Manchester, is the only other bit of passable home ground. And the Liverpool men I worked with have always felt the same about Manchester. None of us like drinking the gin. My friend and I, they asked us to go over Quenneborough because uh, we do a bit of... Uh, visiting like and we went over to the women's fellowship and uh, we went over in the motor and uh, we got out at this here little chapel it were a lovely little chapel and they welcomed us in and oh the entire got it lovely and uh, there were a woman there as lives nearby and then they rode houses you know next to the chapel and uh, 200 years old they are and she sat there and she, she, she didn't know where she was going to go. And there another of her neighbours had been there 50 year. I mean, you think when you're going to be thrown out of your house, when you've been there all your life, I think it's scandalous. People ain't got...